obesity introduces a different but a little overlapping uh, set of challenges. We've discussed previously that fat tissue grows through hyperplasia, which is the multiplication of fat cells, or, well, I should say and or hypertrophy, which is the expansion, the, the, the volumetric expansion of each individual cell. Now, I do say and because at, at least at an initial point of fat gain, you're going to have a little bit of both. But then after a little bit of fat gain, it's overwhelmingly in the average individual going to be a matter of almost purely hypertrophy. That's why the increased size of the fat cell matters so much. And as the fat cells become hypertrophic, they begin to secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, C-reactive protein, interleukins, uh, all, all of them. And these cytokines impair insulin signaling. Uh, as I've noted before, inflammation is a cardinal cause of insulin resistance, but they also promote muscle catabolism. And the result of this is a state of some chronic low-grade inflammation that disrupts the anabolic signaling of the muscle, thereby promoting anabolic resistance. And another feature of the hypertrophy of the fat cell, in addition to the inflammation, which I'm going to revisit, is that it starts to promote, it becomes insulin resistant to prevent its further growth. Now, this isn't a lecture about fat cell dynamics as much as I always have a hard time not talking about that. But as the fat cell gets too big, it starts to promote insulin resistance to stop its further growth. But at the same time, in addition to the inflammation that it's leaking out, which causes insulin resistance systemically, the overall metabolic milieu has changed in a way that I don't want to get into right now for the sake of time but, and have indeed discussed previously. But it also further promotes insulin resistance throughout the body. And insulin resistance is damaging to the muscle in ways that go beyond glucose uptake. Under normal conditions, insulin acts as an anti-proteolytic signal. It's an anti-catabolic signal suppressing muscle protein breakdown. It does not directly stimulate muscle protein synthesis. That is not true, and it has been shown to not be the case in both isolated muscle cells and in a whole muscle in humans. So to say that another way, insulin is not essential for the building up of the muscle, for the anabolic side, as much as insulin is an anabolic hormone. Insulin's effect on muscle protein synthesis and muscle mass is more so on the other side where it is reducing the catabolism or the breakdown. But of course, in insulin-resistant individuals, the suppression of the catabolism is blunted. And so the muscle continues to degrade protein, even in the presence of insulin, when insulin would be attempting to signal the muscle to hold on to it. Now, that's not to say insulin doesn't facilitate some uptake of the amino acid. It does. So insulin helps the muscle pull in amino acid, although it's not necessary for it, but that it stops there. But even still on that front end, when insulin signaling is impaired, amino, amino acid uptake can be compromised, which can, of course, mitigate some degree of muscle protein synthesis, even if in insulin isn't directly involved in that process. But nevertheless, it does make it clear that if insulin isn't working well, you have a double hit where you have some degree of compromised synthesis and absolutely compromised inhibition of muscle breakdown. One other comment on obesity before we mention inflammation a bit more is that obesity leads to the accumulation of lipids within muscle. This is a condition known as myosteatosis. In fact, this comes right back to the hypertrophic fat cell as it becomes insulin resistant. It's leaking out its fat as free fatty acids. Now, one may say, well, that's no problem. The muscle can just burn those free fatty acids. Muscle loves burning fat. Ah, but not if insulin is elevated. If insulin is elevated, but the muscle, the, the fat cell isn't listening, so it's leaking out its fat anyway, then that fat is forced to get stored elsewhere, like the muscle. Now, I mentioned muscle stores more lipids. Some are more relevant than others. Among these lipids, ceramides, which you've heard me discuss previously, are particularly disruptive. Now, ceramides are simply one of the thousands of different types of fat within every cell of the body. Ceramides are so relevant to conversations of metabolic health because they interfere with anabolic signaling by inhibiting a protein within this cell called AKT. And I mentioned mTOR earlier. Actually, all of what mTOR is doing is related 
to what AKT is telling it to do. So suffice to say, these signals are getting disrupted because ceramides are acting like uh, some bar that is some some rod or stick that's just jamming up the the, the gears or the, the wheel here. It's stopping things from turning and working. Now, this overlaps heavily with type 2 diabetes, where you have all the glucose amplifying inflammation. Hyperglycemia does result in hyperstimulation of um, white blood cells or immune-related cells. And we have that ceramide buildup, which starts to create a very vicious cycle. In even young individuals that are obese, we see this, uh, especially in off-season athletes where they suddenly become less active, they gain fat, and they can have a rapid reduction. In fact, there's a human study showing that in professional soccer players during the off-season, they can have a 10 to 15% reduction in muscle function in just weeks. So some early intervention uh, is critical.